for this afternoon. This will be the hands-on operation of the SU-3500. Thank you all for coming. Again, my name is Jamil Clark with Hitachi High Technologies here at Polytechnic University. So at first, we will come over this way just to show you the sample loading process. We do have different types of holders uh, that can be used and available for the SU-3500. This one is a very large uh, custom style holder that we have that can accommodate 30 different pins. What's useful about this is the fact that each of the individual stubs, uh, as long as the samples are relatively small, uh, can be fit onto this uh, and placed just by uh, placing your uh, material onto this type of stub. We have designed this actually for several different types of applications, either for particle size analysis, gunshot residue analysis, uh, things that are a lot more automated. I'm pretty sure uh, Sam from Oxford may touch on that just a little bit as far as large area mapping and other automated features. But once your sample is in, then you can just simply push that onto the holder and have up to uh, 30 different pins uh, available uh, to be inserted into the SEM all at one time. What this does is just helps to reduce the amount of erroring and evacuating the chamber by sample exchange. So we do have quite a selection of different samples uh, available that we're going to observe today. One of them is actually a wind-up clock, and it's actually counting the minutes and seconds as we speak. So uh, perhaps this might be good for stereo imaging, uh, which we will show you uh, live. In addition to that, <clears throat> there are a few prepared samples uh, that I have uh, put together for you guys. Some are with ionic liquid treatment, some are without, some are non-conductive, uh, some are conductive, a couple specimens uh, such as the uh, insects, we have a wasp, uh, some ticks and fleas, just a multitude of different varieties just to kind of show the capability of the SU-3500 uh, that can be available. So I do have these mounted already on carbon sticky tabs and I'll just go ahead uh, to the crowd and you guys can pass this along so you can get a closer look optically of how they look. So while the crowd is checking out the uh, specimens, we'll go ahead and check out the SEM um, and see what the various components are. At first, it is a Windows 7 XP system. This is the GUI. It's on a 24-inch uh, wide screen. We actually have two different uh, PC systems that are tied together. This second screen here is actually used for the Oxford EDS system, which is for chemical analysis. And as far as the third screen, if you look all the way in the distance, there is a wide screen that, and if I change the brightness and uh, contrast here, you can actually see that it's tied to the machine itself. So whatever we view on the PC monitor itself will also be viewed there for other participants uh, or for a large classroom environment. Is the uh, stage controller trackball, which is for moving the stage that's inside in the X and Y direction. In addition to that, we also have what we call a control panel. Uh, there are various buttons located as far as magnification. You have stigmation for your X and Y. Focus, these buttons at the top, uh, numbered from one through four, are programmable uh, via the software. So the same toolbar shortcut buttons you have, however, they're assigned as far as the scan speed, for rastering for fast frame, for uh, large area moving, or slower raster rates, so that way we can have a much more higher quality image uh, can be controlled either way, by the mouse via click on the software or by these buttons themselves. Uh, there are brightness and contrast controls, automated uh, functions for uh, uh, normalizing the brightness and contrast, uh, your coarse and fine focus knobs, as well as a preset for your low mag as well. Of course, every PC comes complete with a keyboard and a mouse, which will also be used in operation for the uh, SEM, as well as a chamber scope. So there is an infrared uh, <clears throat> chamber scope that's built into the SEM so that way we can observe our samples from the inside. As far as the initial talks that we've had this morning, there are various detectors on this SEM, uh, such as the EDS system that we have here by Oxford. This one's a, an exact uh, model. Uh, this one located here is our UVD, which is our ultra variable pressure detector. 
uh, that's used for SE, like or edge contrast-based information in variable pressure mode. In the back here, we have our standard Everhart Thornley, which runs at 10 kV, so we can get the first 50 eV uh, for SE signal. And if we take a look on the inside, we actually have another detector that's uh, just above the pole piece. It's called the backscatter detector. This is the one where it's segmented, so that way we can filter out lossy or lossless signals for top uh, topographical, compositional information. It's a very large chamber that we have on the SU3500, which is 322 millimeters wide. And for that, we're able to obtain and place very large, bulky samples into this chamber, roughly about four and a half to five inches tall and about eight inches wide. The backscatter also has this uh, knob, so that way, if you go ahead and just take a look on the inside, for added safety, we can actually retract this, even during live observation, and it brings it out and up, clear away from the pole piece, especially for odd-shaped samples, fractures, things that are not necessarily flat. The stage itself is where we mount our sample holder. It is a slot design with a flat end, so that way we have some kind of orientation. Uh, there are other options available, such as an image navigation camera that can be used on this SEM, so you can take a picture of the whole holder, import that in, and then have an optical correlation with your SEM. So now getting back to the uh, samples here, we're gonna show the loading process uh, using this custom 30 pin holder here. So again, everyone has seen how the, uh, each individual uh, samples look like, and it looks like one of my uh, specimens have kind of walked away a little bit. So let me go ahead and carefully place that back on. And again, this is just a uh, sticky tab, so it's just a minor pressing just to make sure it's securely attached. So from there, I'll simply pull this pin holder out, and then I can push this in and lock that into the holder itself. And I'll go ahead and rinse and repeat this process for each and every individual sample specimen that I have. Okay, I will say these pin holders are numbered from one to 20 which is the uh, <clears throat> zero uh, rotation. Uh, for the additional holders we have here, if there's multiples uh, beyond the 20 count, uh, we'll need to rotate the stage about 90 degrees clockwise in order to accommodate those. And I guess I'll put these down here. Lastly, I do have this clock, so let me just make sure it's wound. And it looks like it's working. And I'll simply attach this off to the side here, see what we can do with that. What's nice about this holder is that it already has the base mount that's attached to it, so it's all one big piece that can be placed into the chamber. So next, we'll go ahead and look on the uh, computer screen itself. And every time that the chamber is aired out, it will be prompted with the specimen exchange button. So as part of your sample loading process, you have to select the appropriate holder. We are using quite a large uh, specimen holder, which is about 102, 127 millimeters uh, wide. I will say that the graphs, uh, the graphical images on the screen are accurate. So if you're not sure what diameter it is, you can simply place it next to the screen and find the closest match available. Next, we click next. And then from here, we'll actually take this holder and put the tallest portion and we want to check at eye level, so it'll be about a plus 10. Once we select the appropriate height, always go for the tallest object, and we just simply click and drag this green circle up. Make sure that's at plus 10, and then we click next on the screen. The next dialog indicates that uh, we have aired the specimen chamber out, and then what we're gonna do now is make sure that this is all the way back for safety purposes and that enables the uh, stage move button. Now, as I click the stage move button, the SEM will beep. And if we go ahead and take a look at the stage, you'll actually see that the stage is moving up. And what this is doing is it's taking those dimensions that we've inputted, and it's going to apply that to the stage and compensate for that height.
After the beeping stops, the screen does advance. And again, if you notice that this holder also has a flat end, so that flat end mates to this other side that's on the stage, and it also gives for uh, orientation. Our next check is as what's indicated on the computer screen to where we want to make sure that the tallest portion clears the underside of this metal plate, which is called a height guard. So now we're going to slowly slide the chamber through, and we can see that the tallest portion is OK. In fact, we have quite a large gap there, and ideally, we would like to have that as close as possible. So I'm going to click the up button and then check again. And I think I can get away with one more. So we would like to have about a one millimeter gap between the underside of this height guard and your tallest sample. And that looks great. So now I'm going to fully insert this. And of course, we can see it reflected on the chamber scope here, uh, the same view of the uh, holder. And now we can evac. The evacuation process typically takes about two to three minutes. It's pretty fast. Uh, since we are going into high vacuum mode, um, that on most cases take about 90 seconds. So given the large volume <clears throat> of the uh, chamber itself, we can see here that uh, uh, given the system design, the evacuation of the turbo molecular pump we have installed and the roughing pump that you hear buzzing in the background uh, readily uh, removes all of that atmospheric pressure uh, that's in the specimen chamber. So just to give a quick overview on the uh, GUI, as we're waiting for this to get to an appropriate level of vacuum for observation, uh, this is a 32-bit system. Uh, it's Windows-based. On the top right, uh, top left corner, we have our stop and start buttons, which will enable the high voltage or disable it. This can only uh, be uh, usable once the vacuum gets to a safe state to where we can actually apply a high voltage uh, energy to the gun source. Uh, we do have a display indicator. Currently, it's set for 5 kV emission current our working distance, which is the focal length from the bottom of the pole piece to the initial sample plane. Of course, our magnification and field of view. And that's followed by an, an additional section, which is for the beam adjustment, beam alignment of the beam to ensure that it travels all the way down the column, as well as the automated functions for brightness, contrast, focus, and uh, the uh, stigma, X and Y. In the center portion, we have the scan rate buttons. Again, these buttons are the same as what's linked on the control panel itself. So whatever is displayed here, it will enact the same function uh, by hardware buttons. Thereafter, we do have the uh, capture button. And that's to acquire all of our images, followed by multiple display modes. And then we have several menus on the right side uh, that we will go into during the operation process um, as we uh, view our specimens. So I just heard the beep, which means that we're up at high vacuum now. And if you notice, you can see that the start button is actually uh, enabled, which is great. So I'll go ahead and press that. What it's going to do now is turn on the uh, high energy. Now we're going to start to uh, produce thermionic emission based on the initial voltage we have flowing through the filament. Thereafter, so, it'll do is, auto is brightness and contrast. Is there a turbo pump or just a roughing pump? Uh, the, both. Both, right? Yeah, both. Uh, and then a autofocus as well. So here you can see that we do have an image already. So because of the automation we have, there really isn't a lot of fiddling you have to do with the control knobs in order to resolve some kind of image. So now I'm just going to take my mouse and I'm going to click the details button so I can have more buttons at the top, which is awesome. More control. And then I'll go ahead and change my mouse to a stage function called RISM. And from here, I can click and drag, or I can click to center uh, for any appropriate uh, uh, area of interest that I care for, and bring that towards the center of the screen. So currently, we do have some uh, granules here. These are just uh, sand particles, I believe. And 
Right now we're at 5 kV, but what I would like to go ahead and do is change, uh, let's, in fact, let's go ahead and focus in on uh, one of these if we could. And here, I'll go ahead to a fast raster screen. You can see that my scan one button has illuminated versus if I go to a slow two, you can see that's a slower raster, but the image is a lot more crisper because we're do dwelling for a longer time per pixel for every pixel line. But the major thing here is what we discussed this morning as far as seeing that light dark, light dark in the imaging. And as you notice, you can see when I go to a lower mag, there is a little difference between the variation of that contrast. As I increase my mag or reduce my field of view, you can see things are very, very white bright. That's what we call a charge artifact, which is not good because that will obscure a lot of the details that we have. So just to show the image comparison, I'll go ahead and just do an auto brightness and contrast just on this one uh, grain particle here. And then I'll do a very small fine focusing to bring that uh, to the imaging plane. After that, I'll go ahead and capture. And currently we are capturing at 140x. So this is SE, and that's labeled at the bottom side for secondary electron imaging, which means this is all surface sensitive information. We can see there's a lot of roughness. Uh, however, there's a lot of charge that's building up right along the top surface, which is the closest point to the primary electron beam. So I was wondering from the audience if there's anything that we can do to alleviate or address this charge artifact. I'm open to all kinds of suggestions. Lower the voltage? Okay, I'm getting lower the voltage from the audience here. So let's try that. I'm at 5 kV, so what's a good value to use? Sure, 2 kV sounds great. So I'll go ahead and place 2 kV here. Now we switched. I will say a lower energy will have a overall lower yield of electrons, uh, secondary electrons that are being emitted from the surface. So I'll click the auto contrast to compensate for that. I'll capture this. So that way we can compare that with our previous image and see how things look. All right, so now we have two images. Here's our first one, which is the uh, 5 kV image. And here's our second one, which is the 2 kV image. And I was wondering from the audience if we can have any comments to illuminate what we're seeing here, any differences. So you're saying we can see more surface features on which image? Once more surface features. On the 2 kV image, which is the image on the left side, what we're noticing here is that the contrast should never change in your image. If it does, that's a very easy way to tell that there's actually some kind of charge artifact or an image artifact occurring. Okay? The first thing that, that's noticeable is we see a lot of light, bright information in the center of the image at the 5 kV, and we do not see that on the 2 kV image, which means all of this is false information. Remember, we are using electrons as an electrical energy in order to detect a secondary electron energy, uh, which is what's being used to represent the overall image. Okay? So here we can see that that has drastically reduced. However, there's still some residual areas that show very light, bright, and dark patches, which is also all charge artifact. Okay. And you can see how that just changed immediately as soon as I exposed the uh, beam to the sample again. So now since we're at a lower KV, we actually have a spot intensity uh, value of 30, which is your condenser lines. Is there any, any other suggestions that you think we can do to alleviate this kind of charge artifact and make this much more of a pristine image. Lower probe current? We could lower the probe current. We have to be careful with this. So we'll go ahead and try 20, 
We changed from 30 to 20 now. And you can see that the image is much, much darker. And what's happening here is that we're actually getting a very, very noisy image. So if I were to do a slow scan as I would before, you can see that we're not able to pick up or detect as many electrons as we have previously. So remember, what you consider as a good quality image is all on the beholder. So there's no linear one way to think about these things. Uh, if this is a great image for you, we can stop here um, and then consider that as our final image. However, what I would like to see is much more of a signal, much more richer signal, improved signal to noise. So I'm actually going to go not to 20, not to 30, but let me try 45 uh, as a value for the spot intensity. This will give us much more beam, much more current. It's also a larger spot. I'm going to do auto contrast and brightness so that way I can normalize that. And then adjust the focus by doing the auto focus here so that way I can bring everything back to the initial imaging plane. And here we are. But of course, with higher current, that means we're having more electrons bombarding the sample surface, and that charge artifact is now grown to be a bit more than it was before. So one thing that we have learned in uh, this morning's uh, discussion was the fact that, yes, SEs are very, very sensitive to charge, and it's only the first 50 EV. What we can do is actually change to a different signal so if I go to BSE comp and use the backscatter instead and do an auto contrast on that. And it looks like I'm not inserted. So let me go ahead and insert this backscatter in. There we go. So now I have switched my signal to BSE compositional. And if you recall, the compositional uh, energy can be up to the same as the primary electron beam, which means it is not a low energy signal that would be susceptible to charge artifacts as the secondary electron signal would be. And if you notice, we kept everything the same except switching detectors. And now we have a beautiful, crispy, stable image with consistent contrast that's not changing. So please remember that if you're having trouble with SE, simply switch over to BSE, which is a detection signal that's not susceptible to charge. You know the time when the sample was like shaking or something? Mm -hmm. What is that for? That can also be charge. There's different types of charge effects. You can have waviness, it can drift, it can pulse, it can go in and out of focus. Lots of strange behaviors can occur. Those are all uh, charge artifacts. The most easy one and typical one that's usually encountered is this effect that we've seen today. Okay. So now we can consider this a final. And so I'll just go ahead and capture this picture just for our reference. Here you can see that the scan rate that we have is quite pretty fast. So our collection rate uh, is not so high given uh, this particular speed. So since we're using the BSC signal, which is more of a current hungry, KV hungry detector, either we have to up the uh, current, allow more signal into the sample so we can get more out of it, or we can actually go into the properties of the capture button and slow down our scan rate, let's say to 64 seconds. So that way we can actually collect for a longer time, increase our dwell time for every pixel, for every pixel line. And simply enough, just by slowing down our scan and improving our collection rate for the backscatter, immediately you can see as we're capturing this image that the signal to noise has definitely improved and it looks just as good as our SE image uh, is uh, at 2 kV. Remember, there's a very high yield for the secondary electron signal, and we do get a very high yield only at the top end of the backscatter uh, spectrum. Everything in the middle, the signal uh, uh, yield efficiency drops down to about 10% of what you would normally obtain from an SE signal. 
So that's why I say it's a current hungry, KV hungry uh, type of detector because then you would need to compensate in order to get that same signal to noise ratio as you would for an SE by increasing the amount of electrons that you have bombarding your specimen. It can. As you increase, the question is, is if things will change uh, when you change the magnification, and the answer is yes. Right now, we're actually spreading the beam across a horizontal field, uh, a horizontal field width of about 907 microns. Now, when I increase this mag, let's say to 1,000 times, now my horizontal field width is about one-tenth or one-ninth of what it was before. It's 127 microns, which means that I have that same energy that's now scanning in a smaller area. So it's going to be the beam density, the beam intensity will increase that much more. And with that said, you can see that, let me do an auto brightness contrast here, that now we're starting to see some of that charge artifact breaking through, even on the backscatter side, which means that it's very excessive charging that's occurring. So the other thing we can do is, uh, is do what, what I call the last resort. So let's say I want to have an SE image and not a backscatter image. Because if we compare backscatter image here with our, so far, the best we can obtain SE image, You can see we're, we, get, we're, we can uh, resolve some morphology here, but not too much compared to the detail we're able to obtain with the SE image, such as this faceting or scaling that we see on the top of the surface here can only be obtained just by uh, the SE signal. That, that is very difficult to discern from the backscatter itself. Uh, as an added bonus, we are seeing some compositional differences just based on the gray contrast level for the BSE, which is great. Uh, but that's absent from the SE. But usually it's nice to have a multitude of different signals uh, acquired from the same field of view, just so that way you have a complementary set of data to, to use and analyze at a later date. So the rule of thumb is if, if you're charging, you want to reduce your KV. If that fails, try reducing your current. The third step would be to change to a signal that's uh, not charge susceptible, such as BSC. And if all of that fails, the last resort would be to go into variable pressure SEM. So now I'm going to do that so that way I can obtain some kind of surface-like info um, by using the ultra variable pressure detector itself. So for changing modes between high vacuum to ultra variable pressure, uh, we can do that simply by clicking the radial button on the right side in the section called vacuum mode. It'll automatically turn off the high voltage and then now you would hear some valving, which means that we're actually leaking uh, gas into the uh, uh, chamber here. So what happens now is there is an indicator just to show the pressure level within the chamber. There is a value on the top side saying current vacuum which is reading what's actually uh, occurring in the chamber as we speak, which is 400 pascals. The below indicator uh, reflects the value we have set for our vacuum setting. It's always, always, always a good idea to start with the minimal amount of pressure and only leak enough gas uh, that you need just to offset the charge. And the reason for that uh, is for the sake that, you know, when you start dumping a lot of gas, you have a lot of molecules and they're going to diffuse the beam. It's just like if it was foggy and you're driving and that will limit the visibility and the range that you have from a distance. The more gas you have, the more dense that fog will become, which will obscure your image. Okay. So we'll, uh, this is kind of a slow process because we do have a needle valve that will carefully regulate the pressure level and here you can see that it's slowly counting down and resorting to a pressure of what we are requesting, which is six pascals. Uh, right now, it just went down to 150, but essentially the vacuum is stable enough to where we can press the start button based on the enable here. But before I do that, since now we're in VP mode, I'm going to go ahead and increase the energy level to 15 kV because we can get away with it. And now we can use the gas pressure 
to offset the charge at this given energy level. So remember, since we have more gas into the chamber, it's going to be very difficult for that beam to penetrate through it. So staying at a very low KV, such as 2 KV, is going to be pretty challenging to get an image. Since we're in VP mode now, we can just start all over, start back at a higher uh, energy level. And now you can see we have the automation uh, working very well to keep the image in focus, keep the brightness and contrast very level at a energy level of 15 kV. If you notice, we're still recovering down to six pascals, which is my requested setting. And you can slowly see that the brightness is increasing on this image. And that's because with less and less gas, we have more and more electrons actually making it from the pole piece down to the sample plate. But what's great about this uh, material is that it seems like it doesn't require that much gas to offset the charge. But I'm still doing, I'm still utilizing a backscatter signal. And what I want is an SE-like image. So for this, we will need to go back up to our signal select menu and select UVD, which is our ultra variable pressure detector. Click the auto brightness and contrast. And now we have an SE-like image in variable pressure mode, but the best part is we do not have those charge artifacts like what we've seen uh, before. So now I'm going to reduce my, uh, or speed up my capturing rate. Do another auto brightness and contrast. Just that to make sure everything looks great. Then I'll click Capture. And here we can see we're getting a little bit of variation now because now I'm at the minimal amount of pressure. So we probably need to increase the gas again, maybe to a good 10 to 20 pascals to really help it uh, uh, normalize and uh, neutralize those electrons that are resting on the surface. So now I'll take my slider. Move this up to 20. And of course, give it a little time so that way uh, we can allow the gas to penetrate and leak into the chamber. You can also notice here if I also go to a faster scan, we're reducing by dwell time and then it's back to normal again. Since we're getting more gas, we're getting more ionization, therefore we're getting more signal for the UVD. It is a photon-based detector. Those photons can be generated either from the sample itself or from the uh, cascading collision effect from those SCs that are escaping the sample plane and hitting other gas molecules on the way to the uh, uh, UVD detector itself. All right, so that's getting closer. We still only have 15 pascals in the chamber, and it looks like we just made 25. And there is a bias control for the UVD, so that can be check marked. Normally, it's always at 100, But that can be reduced down, so that way we can limit the amount of uh, signal that we're uh, receiving at the detector. And now we're able to normalize and get that nice surface edge effect right across the uh, sample plane for this uh, sand grain here. So just as a review, we'll go ahead and transfer all of these images into PCI and do a tile and fit. So that way we can uh, see what kind of progress we have done uh, with our samples. Uh, what's also nice about the PCR program is that we can normalize the brightness and contrast by adjusting the histogram. So I'll go and do that for each individual image here. So that way we can highlight the best and the worst of each micrograph. And to find this histogram, you go to process menu, histogram is there. Uh, again, this is an SEM, which means that you're getting grayscale information. These are 8-bit images, 
So they'll have a gray scaling from 0 to 255 since it's 2 to the eighth. What we want to do is make sure your triangle on the left side is to pixel 1 of information and the uh, end marker on the right side is towards the last bit of information. And then we can just use the center just to do a quick fine tune uh, to balance out the contrast. And now for the remaining bottom three, let me go ahead and do that. Slide the center one over to balance that out. Second to last, this one doesn't look too bad. And for the final image, And here we are. So for our top left, we have 15 kV UVD. Looks great, looks beautiful. Right alongside that, we have a high vacuum image of 2 kV in backscatter mode, showing that there is some kind of material difference along the sand grain. Um, next to that, in high vacuum, we have a 2 kV SE image, which does show uh, very high voltage contrast or chart artifact that's present along the surface. And for the remaining images is basically identical, except for the bottom uh, middle one, which shows 2 kV for BSE. However, it's very, very noisy, so it's not a very rich uh, image. So now, in essence, we have two different sets of information. So let me go ahead and expand those so that way we can see that now we're seeing the exact morphology and surface effect along the grain uh, plane and the backscatter itself. Okay, any questions so far? All right. So moving on, I do have uh, other types of uh, samples that are also present. So let's uh, navigate and see what else we can find and view here. I'll put this on a faster raster and let me see what else we have. Oh, okay. So sometimes with the lowest mag here, it may be difficult to uh, see the overall sample holder because it's very large. Uh, one trick that we can do is we can actually lower the Z I'm going to lower this all the way down to, uh, let's say, 50. Oh, wrong one. And uh, what's nice about the SEM is that although the stage is lowering, and I can show you that on the chamber scope, uh, it tries to maintain focus as much as possible so that way you don't lose your image. Well, the idea here by going to a longer working distance is so that way now I can get a much lower uh, field of view. So now I can go down to times seven magnification. At a short working distance, there's only so much of a deflection you can do. So the minimum mag will be maybe 40x, 30x. With the longer, we can actually sweep uh, a much larger area. The minimum uh, magnification the scope can do is 5x, actually, which is not bad. So given this lower mag, now we can see the entire stub for the sand grains that we were working on earlier. And that will help me to move the stage around so I can see what else we can look at. Um, and is uh, Mr. Jim Kilcrease available? I wasn't sure which one is which. OK, can you guys hear me now? OK. Um, so we have a couple ionic liquid treated samples here. Um, some leaf material that have some lesions on them. Um, one is treated with ionic liquid in ethanol, and one is treated with ionic liquid in water. Um, so if you just pick one, Jamil, we can, we can take a look at it and, and see how it looks. Okay, so one was green and one was brown? Correct. Correct. And I think I have the green one on the left. So which one was that one? Yeah, you go know? ahead and take a look at that one right there. That's, that's the one treated with ionic liquid in water. But they're both treated with Correct. IL anyway. Correct. One is washed and one is not washed, so one may, you may see a little bit of residual on the surface. 
Okay, so since the, the, both of these samples were treated with ionic liquid, the whole intention here is for us to look at a non-conductive biological specimen that's uh, not been stained, metal coated, or anything in a high vacuum environment. So now I'm going back to high vacuum so that way we can see if this ionic liquid stuff really works or not. It really depends on uh, the specimen. Uh, so the question is, is how long you have to treat a specimen for ionic liquid, and it, it really depends on, on the specimen. Uh, it, it's, it basically works based on osmotic pressure. So if it's pretty porous and, and uh, not so dense, let's say something that doesn't have an exoskeleton to it, it could be a matter of maybe tens of minutes to maybe about a half hour to a, an hour tops. In some cases, you may have to have them soak overnight uh, or even a couple of days, especially for more uh, durable materials or, or, or something that is not so highly porous. Um, we, we, that as well? Uh, we have different functions for aligning the beam column itself. So the, the question is, is on the 3500, <clears throat> whether it uh, automatically aligns the beam? And the answer is yes, but not during this process here. This is only doing the uh, focus correction, stigma correction, brightness, and contrast. Uh, so all of the different KV settings have their own alignments, and it does recall those alignments for that specific KV setting. But if we go into the alignment menu, at least for this case, in the beam adjustment, right here at the top, there is a beam adjust auto. And that will actually control and align the beam tilt and the beam shift at the gun level, and then work its way down the column to the sample plane. Once all that is set, it's usually pretty static. And then we just rely on the minor electronic alignments for a given KV setting. Um, uh, during normal operation. Okay. So I think this is pretty good. It doesn't look too bad as it is. I'm at 5 kV. Now I'm going to bring my stage back up because shorter working distance means better resolution, better detection, closer to the uh, signal. All right, let me stop there. And um, I figure you wanted this data as well, right? To save, to take uh, with you? No, I'm sorry. Where is he? Uh, oh no, he's not here. All right. Oh wait, yeah, you for you, right? Yeah. This is your stuff. Okay. So I'll just start off with the Lone Mag One at first. And capture that. But I do believe we have success so far, because we are in high vacuum. I'm at a very decent energy level, which is 5 kV. <clears throat> and we can see that the contrast is, is pretty normalized uh, without doing anything special so far. Um, there are a, a little bit of concerning areas, probably right at the corners. But it could be just a matter of how it was prepped initially, or maybe uh, the wicking uh, uh, was performed at these ends and not so much uh, uh, of that ionic liquid penetrated the uh, membrane. Yeah, yeah, that is charging here. This is charging. So I'm thinking it's the wicking method for removing the ionic liquid was probably done at these corners, you know. Uh, it could be a little bit of overwashing as well, but overall, especially for the larger section, uh, it's, it's holding up fine. And I haven't really done anything special yet. So we'll mag in, which will increase the energy level um, and also the beam density. Take a look at some of the uh, surface structure here that perhaps uh, Jim can better explain than I can. Um, so I'm not sure if you still have the microphone. But you know, if you can kind of give us a, a little bit of a background since uh, you're the plant guy. Because to me, I believe this is the stomatas we're looking at, which is the underside of the leaf. Is that correct? That is correct. And right. actually, Harry can chime in here, too. This uh, sample you had had little small lesions or maybe insects on top. Oh, OK. That makes it even more fun. 
Okay, so yeah, I, this, this sample was just picked from a, from a tree, so for us to look at, and there were some small uh, dark lesions on the bottom of the, the actual leaf. And so what we're seeing here, we'll see if they're actual, they're insects or it's something that was extruded from, from the leaf. So that, these, those are the large sort of egg-shaped um, units that we're seeing here. So I'm just taking pictures at different magnifications, so. But it's looking great, contrast looks good. I think the ionic liquid, uh, how this was treated is, is excellent. So uh, we can see that <clears throat> it looks raised as far as the uh, uh, stomata structure. One thing with plant leaves and any biological specimen is that uh, if we were just to place this simply in vacuum as is, it would deflate and dehydrate. And a lot of these surface structures would tend to flatten out or collapse. And we're not seeing that here. So I'll go ahead and zoom in on this corner here because I think that's actually a, a nice aspect to have. Um, just to kind of show uh, how well ionic liquid works. And it looks like there's a whole lot of stuff going on here. And so it actually looks like we do have a fungal pathogen. Um, that was infecting these leaves. So we can start to see actual hyphal structures uh, on the surface of the leaf here. And without treatment with ionic liquid, these would all be very much collapsed, and you wouldn't see this depth of structure that you're seeing in these images here. Yep. So what I noticed here is that as I changed my focus knob, the image was moving. <clears throat> and this focus is supposed to objectify my beam to the sample plane above it or maybe below it. It should be perfectly perpendicular to the sample plane. If it's slightly off axis, it's going to appear as if the image is moving because I'm focusing in two different locations as it's driving in and out of focus this way. So the aperture line, which is what it's doing now, is pulsing. Uh, by exercising that same current level on the objective lens. And what I want to do is to minimize that, and that can all be done electronically just by these two knobs here. And the trick here is we want this to basically breathe in and out or in a circular pattern. And here, if you look against my mouse, it's not really shaking or moving or oscillating around. It's pretty much holding steady. If it was off axis, let's say here, then you're going to see a lot of movement, okay? So I reduce my spot intensity just a little bit more. And then now since we're at a higher mag, which means my alignment is that much more sensitive, I am refining that just a bit. Now I do the same for stigmation X, but it's perfect. It's not moving. Let me check Y. You can see it pulsing and breathing in and out but it's not moving, the, so it's perfect. This machine is great, and that's it, we're done. So now I can continue on and focus. And it's always a good idea to just do one knob at a time. Focus, dig X, pass through it, then find the center. Go back, rinse and repeat on focus just to refine. And then everything should just come right in. Once that occurs, then we can mag back down. Because while you're doing the uh, adjustments, it's always good to do it at a higher mag than the uh, level that you plan to take your image at. There we go. And what I would like to do is optimize my brightness and contrast so there is a histogram setting. If you go to the optics menu, BC adjust, and then you can click histogram. And here we have a real-time display of our gray levels. And what we want to do is spread this graph out as much as possible, but keep it centered so that way we're not getting any cutoff. So you can expand it by increasing your contrast and you can shift it left and right by your brightness. And now simply by having my histogram balanced out, you can see how much better the images look as they are. So it's perfect. Now I can take a picture of this. 
And as Jim mentioned, uh, yeah, there's a lot of fungus on this leaf. So you can see the, uh, the spore network uh, covering the stomata. The stomata is basically the opening uh, pathway uh, for oxygen uh, absorption into the leaf, <clears throat> which is a good entry point for fungus in order to uh, take advantage of the nutrients um, and moisture uh, that may be present on that part of the particular leaf. Am I right? Is that okay? Okay, thanks. So I'm learning. <laughs> so let's go ahead and uh, pan around a little bit and see what else uh, is present here. I do. And we will finish out quite shortly because uh, now it's time for our next section. I just wanted to grab a few more images here before we move on. So, so far we've learned what SE looks like, what BSE looks like, and the different components of the backscatter signal. Uh, we did discuss a little bit about charge artifacts and ways to mitigate uh, those types of uh, effects from occurring during your imaging, low field of view, electron beam alignment, and finally, the next one would be stereogram imaging for uh, 3D. And hopefully if one of my counterparts can come over and get some glasses, I'll go ahead and look for this clock that I have in chamber here, which uh, shows good depth of field. The BSC can be used in high vacuum or variable pressure, but again, backscatter, you can use it for composition. You can use it for topography. Um, if, if it's not too much of the surface features you're looking for, you can use that as a substitute for SE in high vacuum. Otherwise, you're going to VP and use the UVD to give you that SE-like image. Okay. Sure, sure. It's, it's a, uh, the, the question is the objective aperture, uh, which is located right on the column here. The standard position is number three. And we have designed this to where you can actually change and get better resolution a smaller spot with a smaller number on the spot intensity. If you need more current, you'd use a bigger number here. Um, and it's pretty well balanced so that way you don't have to play around with the objective aperture so much. It's quite advantageous if you want to improve your depth of field. So if you have a lot of tall and short structures, you would use a smaller hole, which is number four, and that would help to narrow your beam more so that way you can keep things uh, maintained in focus along the z-axis. Uh, the smaller apertures in general will give you better resolution, but we specify our instrument based on number three. So number three is kind of a easy middle per se, especially for anything that's around 20, 30 kx and higher. If you're really going to go for high resolution imaging, let's say 50 kx, 70 kx, 100,000 times, then going to aperture number four would be ideal. If you need more current, which is what we're going to see in the second segment as far as analytical capability, because the more current you have, the more x-ray signal you get, then you want to move the objective aperture to position two or position one. That's a larger hole. So hopefully that answers your question. The contrast levels, you mean? Yeah, there is, because it is a different signal. So you're going to have a different yield effect between each signal type. Uh, the question was, uh, if, why is there a variation in contrast levels between different signals? So with the backscatter, uh, it likes a lot of current, it likes a lot of KV, plus it's segmented. So we're only looking at part of the signal, not the entire signal, because we're tuning out or filtering out or blocking the, the, let's say, the lossless type of BSE. So when we do compositional, for example, if I switch to BSE here, comp, 
This is a uh, <clears throat> visual representation of the backscatter, and we're only using these four segments in a positive bias. If I went to topographical, we're only using half the segment. Half of it is plus, the other half is minus. So we're getting a lot less signal. You can see that the contrast is a lot darker because it's less segments that we're using. SE will always give us the richest signal because that's always the highest yield. The UVD is based on photons. Those photons are generated from other SEs and BSEs. So it's kind of a secondary or a tertiary signal that we're using to utilize that kind of signal effect based on the initial interaction from the primary electron beam on the sample plane. So the contrast ranges can, will vary depending on the signal and which segment uh, you're using at that time. In addition to your spot intensity and your energy, again, if I went to 20 kV, for instance, it's going to be a higher energy. I'm going to get that much more current. And you can see now we're resolving uh, a little bit better in this fast raster for BSE. If I went to COMPO, now I'm using all four signals. It goes bright white. So now I'm going to have to normalize my contrast to back that off. And now you can see it's starting to resolve quite well, even on the fast scan mode. But for SE, you can see how rich the signal is, even on the fastest scan. So it's just the nature of, of that and the efficiency of our detectors at this time. So that's a pocket watch running? It sure is. So now I'm going to set up for uh, stereo imaging. I'll move to another part, which shows a little bit of depth. Let's see here. Uh, we do. Yes. Uh, I will say on the later 3500s, you can get that. So we do have upgrades available for a fee, uh, so that way you can have that capability. Because I don't see it on here. Just to let you know. But it, you know, it's only like an installation fee. It's nothing. Um, but you can use any uh, screen ca uh, capturing program for this. And for stereo imaging, we just click the Live 3D button, and we simply turn this on. And what happens is we actually deflect the beam uh, negative, positive. And on the lower left side, this is just your normal top-down image. And then we actually have the overlay, which is uh, on the lower right. And it should look OK, because for me, it looks fine. All right. If you don't mind, I'll check just real quick. And remember, the red is on the left. Yep, that works. So what, what I'll do now is I'll just go to full screen on this. Ah, uh, I see. Uh, let's do that. There we go. So I figure it might be best on the, on the large screen there. There's one other specimen I can quickly travel to besides a working watch. But essentially, anything with structure uh, can be quite useful. There we go. That should have a, a very decent effect there. So you can actually see the divots within the, uh, the metal plane there. Any questions so far? All right. 
Well, that concludes this session, which is just about the overview of the SCU 3500 by Hitachi. Uh, we're going to move on after a couple minutes uh, to switch over to our colleague for the Oxford uh, analytical portion for today's workshop. Thank you very much. So, all right, welcome back. Now we're going to look at the analytical aspects of this microscope. Now, as Jamil and I are working together here, he has set up, we have to get everything right here on the microscope side. As he pointed out earlier, garbage in, garbage out, we require that the microscope be set up optimally so that what we're going to acquire on our end is representative of what you're looking for. So, in any event, we have a brass sample in the chamber set up. It's a broken surface, so it's pretty much an unknown, but other than brass, what is it made of? So we've set up some parameters to quickly start characterizing this, and as you can see, we're getting a lot of copper and a lot of zinc, which you would anticipate in most brass materials. So we'll let the spectrum run for a bit, but as you can see, we're, we're getting plenty of counts and lots of other things popping up that could be, but probably are not really present. We can turn lines, if we have a, an element that is suspected to be present, we can turn that line on to see if it is being masked, is it present, or just not there at all. Some, certain things can be below the detection limit of the instrument, and in a, in, in a lot of alloys, as uniformity is the process controlled, you want to, you'll find that in high magnification or even low magnification work, uh, some elements won't show up very much, primarily because of the uh, alloying effects and how they're dispersed throughout the material. But this is a general view overall of this particular sample. Right, so at first, <clears throat> the first thing to do again is just to make sure that your image is good, once your image is okay. When it comes to x-rays, it's all about exciting those K, L, and M lines. And in order to do that, you actually have to have a higher energy than the shell value, uh, so that way you can kick those out of the uh, 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 atomic structure and generate an x-ray from that. So the amount of x-rays you generate are going to be far less than what you could ever obtain, let's say, from an SE signal or a BSE signal. So it usually requires a much, much higher KV, let's say 20 KV, 30 KV, depending on what materials you're observing. And then you have to increase your current and also, in some cases, open up your objective aperture. You'll have three different charts under rate meter on the right side. It shows your input counts, it shows your output counts, and it also shows you your dead time. And then Sam will explain a little bit. Sure. The dead time, as you can see, we're running in the green, which is where we want to be. It's essentially how much energy or information the detector can take in. In the green or say 40 to 60 percent, you're going to collect in a very efficient manner. If it were very low down in the yellow region, you're not getting enough signal. You're wasting time. If it's up on the high end, in the red, you're shoving too much through the pipeline. You've got to turn down your beam current. It cannot process that much information. So optimally, is where you want to be, and depending upon your sample, depending upon a lot of things, 40 to 60 percent is a good target from an efficiency perspective. So, so to think about it, as far as your input count rates and your output count rates, input, as he said, uh, Sam said, is about what's being accepted as, 
far as x-rays into the detector. Output count rates is actually what's already processed through the EDS uh, pulse processor system. The bottom chart is the dead time, which uh, Sam will uh, talk a little bit more on how that relationship plays with the input and output count rates. Right. Your input is just that. Information going in, output is what we can process. So they have to have, you have to have a balance, and that balance is established as dead time. What can we process? As far as what you're shoving through the pipeline, how can we get that information back out in a reasonable fashion? You can run in the red and on the lean side, but realistically, you're not running the instrument in the optimum way, not being efficient at all. So you want to keep your dead time to a point where maybe you want to run the spectrum for a minute. You got plenty of counts. It's nice. Maybe your sample is nicely polished. <laughs> it's a function of the environment. So, depending upon your sample, generally people time these out. Uh, we could run it for just a few seconds. Yes, I see exactly what I need to see. I need to move on to a different area or to uh, something more specific. But nonetheless, Keep that dead time so that you're working in an efficient manner, getting information uh, and right. not starving the instrument. So does everyone understand what dead time means and how it works? Clear? Yes? The input, input signal to the, the beam, the primary beam, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the left the Right. The question is, is, does the input count rate relate to the beam, beam level, beam energy, or the amount of electrons coming down the column? And the answer is yes. The output is based on your process time. The dead time is showing you the ratio between what's being accepted and what's being processed. So when you have, for example, 50% dead time, which all these EDS apps guys like to do, I'm more of a 20 and 30% guy, that means half the time the EDS is not accepting x-rays because it's processing those, the previous x-ray information. So for me, it's like almost a little bit of a waste because that means if I spend 10 minutes producing a map, five minutes of that time of x-rays coming in is being thrown out. So if I do a 20% dead time, then I'm actually utilizing 70% of the time to accept more x-rays, process that information, and it's only down for that 20% of that 10-minute time. So I'm losing, in a way, only two minutes of x-rays worth of information. That's the way I think about it. So again, it's like what Sam said. It's a ratio. It's a level. And it also depends on the amount of counts that you have because you may not need to be, let's say, mid-graph. As long as you're able to get a good... Uh, respectable spectrum and soon we'll talk about like the continuum and how that plays a role charging because I know charging can shift the continuum and that can also change the how the auto ID and the elements and the peaks line up against your graph those are all very important things to think about right and you pointed out you know, I think in your presentation a continuum uh, electrons where they actually come from beneath the surface and they have to be addressed just like the overlaps and matrix, matrix effects. So, so question, we, the yes, it does. It does affect. Yes, you do. Yes. Absolutely. Because your sample is very active. It's moving. It's under the beam and those extra electrons as they're emitting, you're, you're getting bogus information. That's why I mentioned the continuum. Right. Because how there can again, you tell if your sample is charging? It's going to glow. It's going to move. It's going to do things that it shouldn't be doing. Right. Also, you can look at the continuum. So there's two different types of x-rays, right? Yep. You have characteristic x-rays and you have continuum x-rays. Right. And they serve two different purposes on this graph that we see here. Here, if you look, 
We just blasted the beam across the whole field of view, and now we have all kinds of information. That's number one, right? Number two is we have our input and output rate balanced out 50% dead time. We're all in the green zone, okay? Next thing is, is it charging or is it not charging? To tell, it's not just an image side. We covered that already. You can tell on the x-ray side too, because if you take this graph and you just click and drag it up, if you look all the way at the end, all of this, they call this background, which is from your continuum x-ray, all right? And what you want to see is that the value you have set on your SEM, which is 20 kV, should be set here as well. If you have charging, the end of that will either shift up or shift below that 20 kV value. Then that means you're so many EV uh, volts or tens of volts off. And if you're looking at overlapping peaks, those peaks could be off by that same amount, which will screw up the whole spectrum. All right, so this is, we're back to confirming our elements. Here's where you might put in, if you suspect that there's something else present, uh, say I think there should be silicon. Well, silicon oh, yeah. should show up. Sorry, I know I'm fighting you here. No, you're fine. But you can right click and set the line up. Include. Because that, that also helps too, is right here. Yeah. And then show Markers. the others. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that's where silicon should be. If that's what we're really looking for and we don't see that, well, it's just not there. So we need to, if we're really looking for that, then we need to make changes so that we're targeting more into this area. So the markers allow us to initiate maybe something that we think might be present, even though we can't find it in the spectra. And what's really cool is the candidate ele elements as well. So if you double click on a peak that you're not sure about, it'll actually give you a few different possibilities uh, on the right side of the screen. So as, as he said here for like silicon, if we go here and just simply click right in that portion there, you can see, okay, maybe silicon, maybe tungsten, rubidium, right. tantalum, as far as a computed. Could be something else that's relatively close by. So there are lots of things that you can do with this software to enable you to get better results. Very quickly, you should be able to get data that's going to get you mostly where you need to be. Based on this, we can calculate composition just by clicking. We're going to follow these sort of an old style flow chart and these are programmable. You can put in specifics based on user uh, knowledge or levels so that you can get more out of the system simply. So we record all the data that's present. Everything is stored within the machine. And once we're complete, we can go to different areas. So we're going to acquire a map. So we've taken control from the microscope. We've, we're acquiring the image now here. Does the map require that um, the sample be flat, smooth, polished? It's nice if it is, but that's not always the case. So it doesn't mess up your, your takeoff angles when you have rough topography? It can. And one thing that we discussed is that this sample does have a great deal of topography relative to the detector position. So what I'm going to do is limit my map into this region where the cursor is because that's oriented closer to the detector. Okay. We should get more so meaningful. I'll just show it all just, so, just to see how it looks, especially for the mapping, because I think it's a good visual as far as what's actually happening here. Yep. 
So if we go to the next tab, which is acquire map data. So this has a built-in workflow, which starts from the left and goes to the right. You start with your description of the specimen, you go to scan image to take your picture, and then on the acquire map, then, well, you know, we, we should do the whole thing, right? So uh, let's say, since this one does have a lot of high topography, then we can see what actually happens if we cover both sides. I use SNPs to pinch off a cross-section view of this. This is actually one of the clock gears. And here uh, you can see that Aztec is smart enough to have some suggestions yeah. on what needs Dead to be corrected. Too high. Right. Well, it's all based on yield. So if you go to construct maps, or did you stop it already? No, it's still going. Then we can at least see. Oh, goodness. Hold on a second. Yeah, turn down your brain. I know, I've got to turn all this. Put this here. And we might need to go to a different. And there we go. There we go. Can you turn down your beam current a little bit? Well, now it's, it's okay. fluctuating. All right, so uh, just a real quick example showing why we're only seeing half the maps. So while you discuss that, I'll, I'll reduce this down. Okay, so what you see, here's our backscattered, our electron image. These are the individual maps that we're picking up from the detector. And you see the strongest signal so far is coming closer to the detector, as you'd expect. There's a ridge here is probably masking that side. So orientation is certainly paramount, and that's a good example of why. Are we running still? No, I stopped it, but I can okay. start it over if you yeah, like. Yeah, go ahead and restart, please. And you want just the small area? Yeah, that's fine. So after you get too many things going on on one picture, you know, it doesn't hurt just to click new site and just start over, even though it's the same field of view. Right. And what, what this helps to do is that it, it kind of keeps your tree organized so you know what is what and which is which. So yeah, we'll grab a new image here. So our data tree over on this side keeps up with all the information that's already been gathered. So that's always there. And how do you want to do the uh, analysis? Let's do, let's do it in this region. Uh, it's automatic. It's on. Yeah. Okay. How do we go back to the map, construct the maps? So now we're looking only in on that side that's not away from the detector. And when you do have topography, yes, you definitely need to maybe add some tilt towards that detector, knowing orientation of the sample relative to uh, what's going on inside the chamber is paramount. So one thing we have here is you can see it's a relatively small area and the scanning rate is going pretty fast. So again, you know, you, you get very, very few x-rays for several thousands of SEs. So we can optimize this a little bit more so that way we can uh, get the kind of resolution that would better match the electron beam spot that we're applying to the field of view. As you can see here, it's kind of a soft map, which is fine for quick analysis, but if we actually want to see a bit more detail, let's go ahead and stop this. There's nothing wrong with increasing your mag on the, on the SEM side. So that way we can fill the screen. If we fill the screen, we can actually take advantage of using a, very small, uh, a much smaller pixel size. Okay. Next, we start over and it's all about the workflow again. So we take a new site. Press start to grab an image. And then before we acquire a map, we go into the settings here. Mm -hmm. And this will help to control the dwell time of how you raster the beam in order to do your x-ray collection. And I'm not sure if you have any points you want to bring up here, but I'm just going to go ahead and increase this to, let's say, 300. Yep. And, and then we're still on a reconnaissance mode here. 
exploring what's present. So. Right. But it's, you know, the methodology of how to kind of get into the ballpark of where you need to be. But 15 seconds for a frame is pretty respectable. Well, so. At that point, or that line. The 300 is like something like a few minutes. No, I don't think it's going to be that long. I don't know exactly how long it's going to be. See, it all depends on your counts, what size detector you have. Here you can see we're only on one scan. And the information is actually becoming pretty legible, just based on a few frames. You can set up for one minute, yes. So when they collect mm -hmm. one minute of count, then they stop. And it stops, right. How do you do that? Uh, right here under acquire. Acquire. Yeah. And you can uh, set to a fixed duration. Fixed duration, right. Fixed duration, that's right. for time. Right? That's time. Yeah, that's for time. Okay. For the count, how about the count? Oh, for the counts, you can do that under spectrum, not under mapping. Right because it's going to vary. Remember, you're taking a spectrum for each and every pixel on your EDS map. So if you reach 1,000 counts on aluminum in one pixel, that may be different from another pixel in a different area on the screen. But for a single spectrum, it's no problem because it's a single point or a small area. What's the advantage of doing the mapping is because since these are SDDs, we're able to get this information quickly and we have individual spectrums for every pixel. So it's much better if you go to mapping. Oh, no. Ah, there we go. Uh, and once it appears to look like you have enough information, you can go back and post-process and reconstruct the spectrum from there. You can even do it live in real time. So let's yeah. say, as an example, this is our sum spectrum. And I want to... Let's say, look at this small red mark right here. These buttons down here are for reconstruction. So even though I'm still acquiring in real time, I can actually use this and pull this out. And this will give me uh, a representative spectrum based on this that area from what's already been saved on a computer. Obviously, the continuum and the peaks are still a little bit noisy, so we should run this map a little bit longer. But so far, it's only been maybe a couple minutes at the most. Let's see, where are we? In fact, it's only been a minute 40 so far. Runtime's two minutes and 30 seconds. But the thing is, is it's flexible because then I can go here, grab a spectrum there, and now you can see that this continuum is starting to clean up a little bit more because now I'm actually getting that much more information aggregated into the, uh, into the uh, EDS mapping database. That's the beautiful part of an SDD. Mm -hmm. So that way you don't have to sit there and poke around to individual real-time spectrum. You can get it all from the map at one time. So you can just let this run, get a coffee break, come back. All your information, more than you could ever use, is right there at your fingertips. Right, this is all real-time acquisition, right. the top half. This is all reconstructed from the map, map right. data. Yeah. So you can do it post-acquisition or during the acquisition. And you can kind of tell because the icons are a little different with these little white arrows here. That's reconstructed information. Cool. This one here is actual real-time scanning information. Yes, I have a question, maybe I don't know what you know. So when you do the, the uh, elemental analysis, mm -hmm. you said you have a, there's a new, new project. Okay. Or new map, mm -hmm. new set. How this thing is related, you know? You have a project, 
Now you have a sample name, you have a map number, you have a state. All these things were related well, there's, to you. Well, in the very beginning, there's a describe your sample yes. or describe spectrum. So that's where, in the very first window, you have an opportunity to put all that information about your sample, your project, a lot number, uh, subsets, you know, whatever information. That's a project. That's a what, project. Right. A project means your actual file name, as we think about it. It's actually a folder. So, so if you have a file name that uh, is under the project? Or no, the file name is the project. The folder right. name is the same as the file name, which is the same as your project. The project is your file name. That's your main name. That's your main name. So what we do here, and I, I will admit Oxford has done a really, really good job, is that if, uh, if you notice here, there's lots of different folders. Each of these names here are different projects. Project and this file name folder are the same thing. And then within that, then they organize the raw data from the program, as you can see here, all useless stuff, unless you have the Oxford inf uh, program. Right. And when you export reports, that's all done here. And then you have this, which is the actual project file. But uh, Nicole, what, Nicolita Dust, mm -hmm. if you notice, is the same as the folder name. Mm -hmm. It's the same. The file. file name. Folder name, project name, same. And everything is all in the same folder. So you can just grab that folder, which is your entire project, mm -hmm. and you can move it to a different computer if you like, and then open up that project, which is this folder, which is that file. All right? And you can process this data on a standalone computer. You need to have a software. So but you, but yeah, that, that's part but of most, the package. Most Oxfords come with uh, a work uh, office PC offline uh, right. for standalone license and you can get more if you need more right because you don't want to tie up the machine while somebody's trying to obtain data while you're massaging your data right you're reconstructed because <laughs> you have everything there you've already collected <laughs> it all you can move to your desk and but I will that. say Oxford did a very good job organizing everything right there. You don't have to go into the program files or the C drive or the users Within and all the that tree, stuff. It's all, it's all, it's right all there. there. Everything is there. And it's all within that project. You well, keep it see, all. That's, that's all in the program itself. That's it. But right. every, all the individual data is tied to that project, that file name. It's all one big chunk. So this is just for organization. So site three, site two, you can name that as sample one, sample two, you know, yeah, whatever. something like that. That's just what it's going to call. But you're not going to see this outside of the program. The only thing you're going to see is the main name, which is your project name. That's it. So the, the reconstruction of an uh, EGS pattern is mainly to take the continuum out and make the characteristic speaks visible more? Is that the reason? No, no, no. It's just to save time. To save time. When you map data, you get spectrums for each individual pixel. Right. So the idea is that you can pull out those individual spectrums later. Right. And that way you don't have to use the e-beam to produce a raw spectrum. That's all if you is. need to, it's there. Oftentimes, people don't ever pull it out. It's like a bucket collecting raindrops. And so all the data is there. So we've looked at doing capturing spectra. We've looked at maps. So as I pointed out, these things happen very fast, especially mm -hmm. from the map aspect, much faster than years gone by. Any questions? What would the, the rasting speed of the frames, number of frames, uh, if you take more frames, you get collect more data points? You're collecting more data, and you're probably going to get better data. That's the trade-off. How much time am I going to sit here and let this machine run? And a good experiment is to take a known sample, something like this, that's you know it's brass, if I run it under these settings for 
a minute or 10 minutes or 30 minutes, yeah. what's the difference I get? Yeah. So you right. may find so that there's no real difference. Here, just to, and, and since very we likely. already have a lot of time on the mapping, right. let's say, let's say I, I check this out here so I can reconstruct. See, my image is back, so it's not running anymore. And I click and drag that right here. There's no way you can tell mm. a live spectrum compared to a reconstructed spectrum. Looks the same. I suppose that's small map. That's for, that's a, that yeah, this is the spot analysis, as you would call it, spot. for this, from the map. Mm -hmm. so or you can click a little spot like this, but you know, you're not going to get much information. It's better if you click and drag pixel. a small box, right. better. Anyway, you'll get, more, you'll get more information, for sure. So that's just kind of a general overview of uh, yeah. x-ray. Is there any specific questions we have? Because we're about to close out. It's about 3 o'clock now. So we'll take any, any questions. Yeah. If I use, uh, I say, file KV, mm -hmm. if I want to know the sample have a barrel or not, so you will not see it because your energy is not high enough to mm -hmm. expect the barrel. That's right. Is that right? The rule of thumb. I, I could, I don't understand the question. Can you repeat the question and... Uh... So, how much energy is needed for a particular element? Ah, okay. And what's the rule of thumb that you should go by for that? More is better. <laughs> About but one and a half to two half, times yeah. the energy. Right. So, so, of course, there's a specific EV energy range. Less than 10. Right, so for 20s. example, yeah, copper is 8.1. I think, but we have this chart here. I go by this thing all the time, and your K alpha is 8.04, okay. your L alpha is 0.9. So, of course, we don't really care about the uh, lower uh, L line range because if you notice on this uh, spectrum here, things get pretty busy and jumbled up on the lower side. So what you can do is confirm by using the higher energy side. And if you go one and a half to two times the energy level of eight, let's say 10, maybe 12 kV, 15 kV, anything higher, that's more than enough to excite that K line. And then you have two peaks to confirm that copper peak. Right. So you do that for any metal there is here. The only trick is with light elements like mm -hmm. boron, beryllium, not lithium unless you go windowless. <laughs> Extreme. But right. then you have to worry about X-ray absorption. absorption. And that's the same thing like interaction volume that you see, subsurface information versus surface information. So then, so then you would do the opposite. You would lower your energy, but make sure it's still enough to excite the x-ray, but not too much to where you're obscuring that x-ray, right. especially the light element x-rays. Oh, yeah, there's a whole science to it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it can get complicated. So lithium is no way, lithium we can. With this detector, no. Th this one, no, it's window. But there are other x-rays available that can detect the lighter element side, but they're right. very special. Right. Very, very special. All right? Another question for you. Yep. So for the, for the SEM, okay, this one, what the file structure looks like? We have several people running a lab. And you go to the computer, you don't what... What I do is I, well, at least for the Hitachi systems, if you go into the computer, you get two drives. You have the C drive and D drive. Wow. We consider the D drive as the data drive. It's just a big empty hard drive. And we set up SEM image as a root folder. And then if you look in here, you can set up your individual, all your users can have their own folder in there. And they can build their projects out. So that way, all their images are in there. That's just normal Windows-style organization. That's it. So when you open the PCI, you, you do a save ID. I do it through here first. Mm -hmm. I use this button to capture, capture. and this properties. Yeah. Well, see, ours is different from yours. Um, here, you, once you capture, it automatically saves. Okay. So. Every time I capture, 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 it'll save to this folder. Then I go to PCI and I import them in, do my stuff, and export it back out. 
see, project? Right, so if you use PCI, it, it's a database style program, so it puts everything in a volume. And that's a different structure. So that's why I save individual image files first, import and then export on PCI. If you have other questions relative to EDS, shoot me an email. My cards are available. Yep, I'll leave some we're cards here, to here help. as well. Please let us know what we can do. We want you to have success with the system and good luck. Thank Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you.